Well, this morning we're not going to have children's church, so my kiddos will have to just deal with it and deal with daddy, deal with daddy preaching today. Because they love to hear daddy talk, right? Oh, thank you, Titus. Yeah, right. <laughs> Today we're going to be getting even closer here to the end of the sermon series in the book of Daniel. And we're looking at Daniel 11 today. So if you have your Bibles with you, we'll be looking at the entirety of Daniel chapter 11. Now you say, wow, there's 45 verses. Um, that doesn't mean my sermon is going to be three hours long, okay? Um, just, just to give you guys a little bit of a um, calming of your spirit there. But we'll read through these 45 verses to start off with. So if you have your Bibles, Daniel 11, 1 through 45, today I'm actually going to be reading from the NIV version. And in the first year of Darius the Mede, I took my stand to support and protect him. Now then, I tell you the truth. Three more kings will appear in Persia, and then a fourth, who will be far richer than all the others. When he has gained power by his wealth, he will stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. Then a mighty king will appear, who will rule with great power and do as he pleases. After he has appeared, his empire will be broken up and parceled out towards the four winds of heaven. It will not go to his descendants, nor will it have the power he exercised, because his empire will be uprooted and given to others. The king of the south will become strong, but one of his commanders will become even stronger than he and will rule his own kingdom with great power. After some years, they will become allies. The daughter of the king of the south will go to the king of the north and make an alliance, and she will not retain her power, and he his power will not last. In those days she will be handed over, together with her royal escort and her father, and the one who supported her. One from her family line will arise to take her place. He will attack the forces of the king of the north and will enter his fortress. He will fight against them and be victorious. He will also seize their gods, their metal images, and their valuable articles of silver and gold and carry them off to Egypt. For some years he will leave the king of the north alone. Then the king of the north will invade and rel the realm of the king of the south, but will retreat to his own country. His sons will prepare for war, and assemble a great army, which will sweep on like an irresistible flood and carry the battle as far as his fortress. Then the king of the south will march out in a rage and fight against the king of the north, who will raise a large army, but it will be defeated. When the army is carried off, the king of the south will be filled with pride and will slaughter many thousands, yet he will not remain triumphant. For the king of the north will muster another army, larger than the first, and after several years he will advance with a huge army fully equipped. In those times many will rise against the king of the south, the violent men among your own people will rebel in fulfillment of the vision, but without success. Then the king of the north will come and build up siege ramps and will capture a fortified city. The forces of the south will be powerless to resist. Even their best troops will not have the strength to stand. The invader will do as he pleases. No one will be able to stand against him. He will establish himself in the beautiful land and will have the power to destroy it. He will determine to come with the might of his entire kingdom and will make an alliance with the king of the south. And he will give him a daughter in marriage in order to overthrow the kingdom, but his plans will not succeed or help him. Then he will turn his attention to the coastlands and will take many of them. But a commander will put an end to his insolence and will turn his insolence back upon him. After this, he will turn back towards the fortresses of his own country, but will stumble and fall to be seen no more. His successor will send out a tax collector to maintain the royal splendor. In a few years, however, he will be destroyed, yet not in anger or in battle. He will be succeeded by a com contemplative person who will not be given the honor of royalty. 
He will invade the kingdom when its people feel secure, and he will seize it through intrigue. Then an overwhelming army will be swept away before him. Both it and a prince of the covenant will be destroyed. After coming to an agreement with him, he will act deceitfully, and with only a few people, he will rise to power. When the richest provinces feel secure, he will invade them and will achieve what neither his fathers nor his forefathers did. He will distribute plunder, loot, and wealth among the, his followers. He will plot the overthrow of fortresses, but only for a time. With a large army, he will stir up his strength and courage against the king of the south. The king of the south will wage war with a large and very powerful army, and he will not be able to stand because of the plots devised against him. Those who eat from the king's provisions will try to destroy him. His army will be swept away, and many will fall in battle. The two kings, with their hearts bent on evil, will sit at the, tab the same table and lie to each other, but to no avail because an end will still come at the appointed time. The king of the north will return to his own country with great wealth, but his heart will be set against the holy covenant. He will take action against it and then return to his own country. At the appointed time, he will invade the south again, but this time the outcome will be different from what it was before. Ships on the western coastlands will oppose him, and he will lose heart. Then he will turn back and vent his fury against the Holy Covenant. He will return and show favor to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. His armed forces will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. Then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. With flattery, he will corrupt those who have violated the covenant, but the people who know their God will firmly resist him. Those who are wise will instruct many, though for a time they will fall by the sword or be burned or captured or plundered. When they fall, they will receive a little help, and many who are not sincere will join them. Some of the wise will stumble so that they may be re refined, purified, and made spotless until the time of the end, for it will still come at the appointed time. The king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above all every god, above every god, and will stay, or, and will say unheard of things against the god of gods. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed, for what has been determined must take place. He will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the one desired by women, nor will he regard any god, but will him exalt himself above them all. Instead of them, he will honor a god of fortune a God unknown to his fathers, he will honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. He will attack the mightiest fortresses with the help of a foreign God and, with great, and will greatly honor those who acknowledge him. He will make them rulers over many people and will distribute the land at a price. At the time of the end of the king of the south, or excuse me, at the time of the end, the king of the south will engage him in battle, and the king of the north will storm out against him with chariots and cavalry and a great fleet of ships. He will invade many countries and sweep through them like a flood. He will also invade the beautiful land. Many countries will fall, but Edom, Moab, and the leaders of Ammon will be delivered from his hand. He will extend his power over many countries. Egypt will not escape. He will gain control of the treasuries of gold and silver and all the riches of Egypt with the Libyans and the Nubians in submission. The reports from the east and from the north will alarm him, and he will set out in a great rage to destroy and annihilate many. He will pitch his royal tents between the seas at the beautiful holy mountain, yet he will come to his end, and no one will help him. May the Lord bless us as we read his word together this morning. In Vance Havner's book, who said that? Vance Havner said the following. Our world is vast becoming a madhouse, and the inmates are trying to run the asylum. It is a strange time when the patients are writing the prescriptions, the students are threatening to run the schools, the children to manage the homes, and church members, not the Holy Spirit, to direct the churches. Such lawlessness always brings a dictator, and the last of the line will be the Antichrist, now in the offing, waiting his cue. 
Today we're going to look at our second to last sermon in this sermon series of Daniel. In particular, today we're going to see how chapter 11 goes into greater detail of what I've covered thus far in this profile of the Antichrist. We've touched a little bit on him in these past few sermons here, but today is going to be a main focus on what he is like. And this is all going to take place. This is all future to us. So, so if there's, there's history in this and what we're going to cover today, but where there's also uh, a good chunk of it in this message today that applies to us today and is still yet future coming. I remember as a kid hearing my pastor and listening to sermons from pastor, author, and teacher Chuck Swindoll um, preach on sermons that dealt with the Antichrist. And I remember being fascinated about this and the end times events. And maybe you're that way too, maybe you just don't care, um, but hopefully today you get something out of it. For the sake of time, we're not going to be able to dig too deeply into uh, all that we could about this future character. But for today, we're going to break down chapter 11 into two parts. The first part is going to be very brief, which is verses 1 through 35. And then the second part, which we're going to be our main focus, we're going to look at three different things that we see from our text for today that it describes about what this Antichrist is going to be like. So those are the two things that we're going to look at today. We'll start off with this first section, verses 1 through 35, this Greek Empire and Antiochus Epiphanes, which is history to us. Now, once again, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on these first 35 verses, simply because um, I want to focus on the second part of this chapter. But what verses 1 through, 30, th 1 through 35, uh, if we take them as a chunk, it can be broken up into two parts. And the first comes in verses 1 through 4. And this really sets the stage for this vision here, because this is, if you'll remember, this is the last vision that Daniel receives. This is the, this is the, the, the big chunk of this vision. We looked at the kind of the beginning part of it last week. We're looking at the big chunk of it today, and we're going to look at the end of the book next week. Now, let me just say this about this first part here. You and I will miss the point of this passage of Daniel unless we realize that the whole reason that God revealed this vision in the manner that he did was to move Daniel to pray more effectively for the people of God. We know that Daniel's heart was to see him and the Israelites get back to Jerusalem. That was his heart. But God wanted to take this vision that he was giving to Daniel and show him, I hear your prayers about this, as we saw last week with the angel answering his prayer. I hear your prayers about this and how you want your people to get back to Jerusalem, but my plans for Israel are so much greater and go so far beyond when you actually do return to the promised land. The whole focus of the second half of Daniel has been on how God wanted to reveal himself in even greater ways than what Daniel could imagine. That's why God is giving him these visions here. God had so many plans that were so beyond what Daniel was even praying or even thinking or even imagining what was going to take place for Israel. So verses 5 through 35 here show God showing Daniel what's going to happen when Israel gets back into Jerusalem. Verses 5 through 35 is a recording of the story of conflicts that were going to take place between, as we see here in our text, Syria, which is the king of the, of the north, and Egypt, which is the king of the south. Now, if you've studied this chapter before, you might say, where does Alexander the Great come into play here? In verses 3 through 4 of our text here, we see that Alexander the Great is talked about. But 
in these first 35 verses, he's not the main focus. Instead, the main focus is what came out of Alexander the Great's empire, namely the north king of Syria, which would be Antiochus Epiphanes. Now, if you remember, I'm not going to get into him and the history of him right now. You'll have to look at past sermons. I've, I've talked about him in a past sermon or two. But for those of you who don't remember, just remember that he was one bad dude. And he hated the Jews with a passion. And he did detestable things to them and to the temple of God. Obviously, all of this is history to us. A lot of it we've already covered in previous sermons, which brings me to the main focus of our chapter today, verses 36 through 45. It's in these verses here we see Daniel takes a huge shift in this vision that God gave him. Because it's in these verses that we're given a brief profile of the Antichrist that is to come in the Great Tribulation period that is to come here on this earth. Now, before we get into him, I do uh, want to cover a question. Many people have asked, maybe you've even wondered yourself at one time or another, who exactly is the Antichrist? And what's interesting is, if you were to go into a search engine and type in, who is the Antichrist, you'll see a long list of individuals who have been pointed to throughout the history of time and even now, who people have claimed, yeah, that was or that is the Antichrist. Nero, Napoleon, Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Saddam Hussein, Bin Laden, Bill Gates, Oprah Winfrey, Barney the Dinosaur. Yeah, that's one of them. Now that kind of caught me off guard when I was coming across this list, Barney the Dinosaur, but maybe it has something to do with the dragon that's talked about in Revelation 12. I don't know. George W. Bush was another that was named, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, and most re recently Kamala Harris. Now, I'm sure other names could be added to this, but the main point is that every guess has been wrong. By definition, we cannot know in advance who the Antichrist is because he will not appear to be an evil person at first. It may be interesting to speculate, but it's dangerous because it can cause us to fixate on trying to identify the Antichrist and we miss out on the focus of what the focus should be, and that's Jesus Christ. Now, with all that speculation aside, what do we know about the Antichrist for sure? Verses 36 through 45 tells us a great deal about him. One author describes the Antichrist this way. He says, he will have an oracle skill of John Kennedy, the inspirational power of Winston Churchill, the determination of Joseph Stalin, the vision of Karl Marx, the respectability of Gandhi, the military bravery of Douglas MacArthur, the charm of Bill Clinton, and the genius of King Solomon. Who am I speaking about? The coming Antichrist. He will be the most perfect sort of man from the world's sense since the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's look at a description of his character here. And that's the first thing that we see, a description of his character. And this comes from verses 36 through 39 of our text. It says, The king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will say unheard of things against the god of gods. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed, for what has been determined must take place. He will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the one desired by women, nor will he regard any god but will himself, but will exalt himself above them all. Instead of them, he will honor a god of fortresses, a god unknown to his fathers. He will honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. He will attack the mightiest fortress with the help of a foreign god and will greatly honor those who acknowledge him. He will make them rulers over many people and will distribute the land at a price. 
So here in these verses that we just read, we get a glimpse of the character of the Antichrist, and it's quite a list that we see here. The Antichrist will be arrogant as all get out, never stopping of talking about himself. If you'll remember from Daniel chapter 7, and from Daniel chapter 7 all the way until the end of Daniel, just another reminder, we get into the prophetic aspect of it, okay? It's not the narrative about himself and his life. This is, this is the prophetic aspect of it. And in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel talks about this little horn. Remember me mentioning about this little horn? That little horn is supposed to represent the Antichrist. And it says about this little horn in Daniel chapter 7 that he makes big boasts. He'll be a man who completely lacks integrity. He's a blasphemer, blasphemer, very outspokenly against God, deceptive and ruthless. Now he will not appear this way to begin with. His true colors will be seen halfway through the great tribulation period. At first, he'll be successful and very influential, and, and people will be drawn to him. But as verse 36 tells us, his time will be short. In verse 37, we see that it says that he shows no regard for the gods of his fathers, which means that he'll reject his own spiritual heritage. Now, some Bible scholars say that he'll be of Jewish descent, but I disagree with that. And the reason I disagree with that is if you go back to Daniel 7, where it talks about him as the little horn, it says that this little horn will come out of the Roman Empire. Maybe you've heard this question before. Maybe you've asked this question before. Maybe you've pondered this question before. Where's the Antichrist going to come from? Like, which country or which continent is he going to come from? Many have guessed the United States, Russia, Middle East. But if you stick with what I just mentioned from Daniel chapter 7, it shows us that he's going to be of European descent. Whatever the case, I, I hold to the belief that he's going to be a Gentile. And whatever spiritual background he comes from, he's, he's going to reject it completely. Some other characteristics here that we see that are revealed about him here in verses 36 through 39 is that he'll oppose organized religion and will set himself up as God to be worshipped. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, calls this the abomina abomination that causes desolation. And what that means is that he's going to order all of the sacrifices in the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem to be halted, and is going to order people to worship him. Hold your place here in Daniel, and let's look at this. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verses 1 through 4. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verses 1 through 4. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed, supposed to have come from us, saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Now, back to verse 37 of our text for today. I want to show you something about the Antichrist that before preparing this message today, 
I, I had never heard of before, I had never come across before, and it really just blew my mind, especially um, if you were an individual who has read those Left Behind books, or have kind of imagined what the Antichrist was going to be like, because in my mind, I always thought he was going to kind of be like a Rico Suave kind of guy that have all the ladies around him and all of that sort of stuff. But what we see here, and what I'm about to read to you in verse 37, is this just goes against everything that I've thought about him to be true. Look at what it says here in verse 37. He will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the one desired by women. Stop there. Did you catch that? It's this one desired by women phrase that, that made me stop in my tracks and say, wait a minute, what does that mean? So I went right to the Hebrew. Because for the, you hear me talk about Hebrew and Greek and going to the original. For those of you who don't understand what that means and why pastors always talk about that sort of stuff is because the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. So in order to get the original meaning of something in the Old Testament, you go to the Hebrew of it. Now for the New Testament, that was written in Greek. And so if you want the original meaning of that, you go to the Greek. So I went to the Hebrew for this because this is in the Old Testament. And I, the best description that I could find Find for it comes from the New American Standard Bible, and it says this, and he will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the desire of women. What does that mean? That means that maybe he could be a homosexual, but definitely what it means is that he will ha not have a natural desire for women. That blew my mind, because I never thought of that before about him. But that's what the text says. Looking at our world today and how there's such a cele celebration over, over detestable sexual sins, it's not hard to see then how the Antichrist would be celebrated in this way then. A few more things that we see about his character here before we move on. He'll be a bloodthirsty man whose drive for world domination will be in immensely strong. His power will come from Satan, which is what the phrase, a God unknown to his fathers, means in verse 38. He'll reward those who follow him. And for a short period of time, he will look like the Savior the world has been looking for. But once again, his reign will come swiftly to an end. And that will come when Jesus returns. And that's what we're going to transition into next here. The Battle of Armageddon. Look at verses 40 through 44 of our text here in Daniel 11. At the time of the end, the king of the south will engage him in battle, and the king of the north will storm out against him with chariots and cavalry and a great fleet of ships. He will invade many countries and sweep through them like a flood. He will also invade the beautiful land. Many countries will fall, but Edom, Moab, and the leaders of Ammon will be delivered from his hand. He will extend his power over many countries. Egypt will not escape. He will gain control of the treasuries of gold and silver and all the riches of Egypt. Egypt with Libyans and Nubians in submission. But reports from the east and the north will alarm him, and will, he will set out in a great rage to destroy and annihilate many. He will pitch his royal tents between the seas at the beautiful holy mountain. Yet he will come to his end, and no one will help him. What we just read here was a description of nations that will rise against the Antichrist and his military, and they'll declare war. Now remember, as Daniel is writing this, Geographically, the focal point of where all of these kingdoms are coming in from is Jerusalem. Jerusalem's the, the, the focal point of when it talks about kings from the east, north, south. Those are all coming in, and Jerusalem's the center of that. 
So with that in mind, we see two kings that wage war first against the, against the Antichrist. The king of the south, which is mentioned here, when that could be Saudi Arabia, that could be Egypt, or uh, another nation in Africa. We don't know. And then there's the king of the north, which could be Syria, Turkey, Russia, or some other northern country. We don't know that either. As the Antichrist tries to muster up allies, we see in our text that he says that he's going to invade what is called the beautiful land. You see that in there? He'll invade the beautiful land. That's Israel. It's then that the Great Tribulation period is really going to get going. When kings from the east will wage war on him, that could be Iran, that could be Iraq, that could be Pakistan, that could be India, that could be China, that could be Japan, some other northern, or excuse me, eastern nation. And what we call the Battle of Armageddon will start to take place which essentially is a huge military involvement of many nations, of many armies, lots of battles, hundreds of millions of soldiers. A war that has never of the likes taken place here on earth and never will again. The battles will take place all over the place, but the main focus of the battle is going to be in the Middle East. And a lot, and I mean a lot of blood, is going to be spilled. Revelation chapter 14 tells us that the blood will be so immense that it will flow as high as the horse's bridle at a distance of 200 miles. Imagine that. Imagine the amount of lives that will be lost. And as, as all of this is taking place, all these armies converge on Israel. It's then that the final stage is set and the reign of the Antichrist comes to an end. And that's the last thing we're going to see here today, the Antichrist's fall. Look at verse 45 one more time. He will pitch his royal tents between the seas at the beautiful holy mountain, yet he will come to his end, and no one will help him. If you've ever wondered where exactly the final battle is going to take place, this verse just told you. As the Antichrist sets up his final battle, his headquarters is near Jerusalem, this beautiful holy mountain, as it's worded here, which is between the Mediterranean Sea and the Dead Sea. And this final battle is going to take place in what is called the Plains of Jezreel, or in central Israel, near a crossroads of Mount Megiddo. In the Hebrew, the term, the mountain of Megiddo, means Har Megiddo. So it's not hard to see that translated into English, we get Armageddon. Even though verse 45 doesn't tell us how the Antichrist is defeated, Revelation 19 does. And it's when Christ returns with us as the church to defeat the Antichrist, his armies, and it sets up the Christ's millennial kingdom on earth. I want to close today by looking at these, what I think are fascinating verses in Revelation 19. So turn there with me if you would. Revelation 19, 11 through 21. Revelation chapter 19, 11 through 21. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. 
He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. That can only be talking about Jesus. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen. That's you and I as the church. White and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He, he treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. Okay, stop right there. The sword that comes out of his mouth isn't a literal sword. This is him speaking. What is he going to be speaking? I don't know. But what he's going to be speaking is faithful and true, and it's going to over... And this, and this battle is going to be over by his words. We won't get to swing a sword, folks. This battle is going to be over by him just speaking. And that really shouldn't surprise us. Because if you go back to the very beginning of Genesis, it's words spoken that created everything anyway. Verse 16. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried out in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come, gather together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and mighty men, of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, small and great. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest of them were killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. Here's how I want to close this message today. Is the Antichrist alive today? I don't know. But it should cause us to do three things. Three things this calls for us as believers to do in the here and now. And the first is be on the alert. Be on the alert. Don't get sucked into the spirit of the Antichrist, which is very much alive today. I didn't say the Antichrist was alive today, and I'm not saying he's not. I'm saying the spirit of the Antichrist is alive, and it has been alive since the writing of Scripture. Dig into the Scriptures. Pray for discernment and strength. Be on the alert. Second, stand in boldness. Persecution will grow worse. It's not a maybe. It will grow worse. Will it grow worse in our lifetime? I don't know. It's possible. But it will grow worse for followers of Christ the closer that we come to Christ's return. So stand in boldness, Christian. And then third and finally, submit to Christ. Submit to Christ. The allurement to follow the easy way or the crowd will be enticing and it will be strong. But through the Holy Spirit's power and prayer, we can obediently walk with Christ no matter what may come our way. That is my encouragement for us today. And... I know this might have been a little bit of a different message today, but as we follow the text here in Daniel, I think it's a message that's very relevant to everyone here within the church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know that you will return again, and that is the main focus of this, that you are coming soon. And so I, I do pray that you will return soon, Lord. But until then, I pray that we take what we've heard today seriously. 
that it motivates us, Lord, to not pass up those opportunities, especially during the holidays of when we might be with loved ones who don't know you, of talking about you. Instead of saying, well, maybe next time. Help us to seize this time. Because we don't know if there's going to be a next time. Lord, it's not a... a newsworthy thing to, to look around and see how this world is waxing worse. Of how much closer we are getting to the return of Jesus. And so, Lord, help us to be about your business. Help us to get our priorities straight. I, for one, can say I, I spend time on things that have absolutely zero eternal significance and put that as priorities in my life. But Lord, if there's anybody else that can identify with that here with me, I pray that you will help us to prioritize rightly. May you be glorified in our lives. Fill us to overflowing with you. And Grow your church, Lord. And so I pray these things now in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.